It will be a bit slower than in Africa for various factors, but it will still spread. It will kill millions, even in the countries of the West, because we did not have the courage to face down the narrow vested interests of those who did not realize the harm they were doing, because we know from epidemiology that taking, if you isolate cases, you don't get deaths like this. Let's move on from this horrible story. These are the larvae of the Anopheles mosquito. And there are three interesting little letters which are entirely absent from the IPCC's ramblings about malaria in its latest report. And those letters are DDT. Before the DDT ban, which was brought in as a result of environmentalist pressure, there were 50,000 deaths per year from malaria. After the DDT ban, one million deaths per year from malaria. It's still about 850,000 now. Total excess deaths, depending on which scientific paper you read, between 30 and 50 million people died and are still dying because of that crazy decision by first the United States of all countries to ban DDT. The DDT ban was lifted on the 15th of September 2006. Finally, the world's bureaucracy that governs this, the World Health Organization, decided that enough was enough. And Dr. Arata Kochi said the following. He said, quite often in this field, politics comes first and science second. We must take a position based on the science and the data. And that, in essence, is the position that I'm inviting you in this house to take tonight. There are moral issues, clearly moral issues, that are raised by this debate. And I want to look at those moral issues now. I want to sum up what I've said to you. Now Al Gore says, as you can see on that slide, I believe this is a moral issue. And so it is a moral issue. To announce disasters or scary scenarios, to over-represent factual presentations in place of adherence to the strict scientific objective truth, that is a moral issue to allow politicians to insert false data into official scientific documents, to alter those documents so as to contradict or overstate scientific conclusions, to manipulate decimal points so as to engender false headlines by exaggerating tenfold. Those are moral issues. To claim scientific unanimity where none exists, to assert that catastrophe is likely when most scientists do not, to exalt theoretical computer models which cannot in any event work over real-world observations, to misstate the conclusions of scientific papers or the meaning of observed data, to overstate the likely future course of climatic phenomena by several orders of magnitude, those are moral issues to reverse the sequence of events in the early climate, to persist in false denial that past temperatures exceeded today's, to state that climate events that have not occurred have occurred, to ascribe these non-events as well as specific extreme weather events unjustifiably to humankind, those are moral issues. And above all, to inflict upon the nations of the world a policy of ever grimmer energy starvation, calculated not merely to inconvenience the prosperous, but to condemn the very poorest to remain in poverty forever and to die unheeded in their tens of millions for want of the light and heat and power and medical attention which we have long been fortunate enough to take for granted. That is a moral issue. So this house is the house of youth. Here, high ideals are shaped and sharpened. Here, of all places, it is surely understood that in each of us, however far, how far apart, in mere distance or origin or wealth or achievement, there is the spark of the divine, the image and likeness of our creator. That by this communion with our maker, each of us, however poor, is of unique and precious value, that therefore there is only one race, the human race, that the suffering children of Africa, of Asia and South America, imploring us with their hopeless, hopeful eyes, are our people. 
we must get the science right or we shall get the policy wrong. We have failed them and failed them before. We must not fail them again. We know of a number of feedbacks, including water vapour, the most important feedback. Yet your use of the Spess, Deff and Boltzmann law excludes the effect of water vapour entirely. Not only is there an effect of water vapour, there's also an effect of carbon dioxide from the carbon sinks. As temperature rises, carbon is released from places such as the Amazon rainforest. There's also an effect of methane, which we're already seeing. Now, in your talk, the feedback's not even considered, but in the IPCC pack, uh, um, report, the interacting effect of all these feedbacks, you have a vicious circle, but you have vicious circles on vicious circles. That's what we're facing in this, in this current situation, and by the end of the century. So, so how do you deal with the feedbacks? And apparently there's very little extra CO2 in the atmosphere. Is an increase from 280 to 380 very little? That's all. Thanks. First of all, feedbacks, of course, uh, I did allow for those in the way that the IPCC itself allowed for them by adjusting the Stefan Waltzmann value of 0.3 uh, Kelvin per watt per square meter of radiative forcing to make it 0.5, which is an increase of obviously 67%. And that is, broadly speaking, what the IPCC has done again in its 2007 report. To look at one or two of these climate feedbacks, let me explain what a feedback is when uh, a radiative forcing of any kind um, perturbs what would otherwise be the uniform behavior of the climate then temperature will go up and the fact of temperature going up will it is thought induce further changes in the climate which cause temperature to go up still more <coughs> Now, there is, to talk about your uh, compounding effect of these feedbacks that they, they, they feed upon each other to a certain extent, there is now, for the first time in IPCC's 2007 report, admittedly buried in a footnote halfway through an incredibly technical description of feedbacks in Chapter 8, which is on how the computer models work, there is quite a simple formula, which is what the IPCC recommends for calculating the effect of those feedbacks. And in my own calculations, I have therefore allowed for the mutual reinforcement to which you quite rightly refer. To study one or two of the individual feedbacks, the water vapor feedback is, of course, largely uh, cancelled out by the lapse rate, which arises from convection and other atmospheric processes. However, for purposes of my calculations, reaching the 1.6 Celsius for a doubling of CO2, which is my best estimate, um, I have allowed the uh, IPCC's values as published in their 2007 report, and I have not sought to argue with or amend those values or in any way to change the mutual reinforcement uh, formula. The CO2 feedback is indeed uh, one which is evident, but it's really quite small. Indeed, the IPCC doesn't really know how big it is. It publishes a range of estimates from 25 to 225 parts per million per doubling of CO2. This is a very big range. Their best estimate, which is really only a guess, which interestingly was arrived at by nothing more scientific than a show of hands, is 87 parts per million by, vo by volume per doubling of CO2. And that would have a not quite negligible, but still a very small impact on temperature as a feedback in its own right. As to methane feedback, that is not quantified at the moment in the IPCC's documents for the very good reason that the atmospheric concentration of methane, which had been rising on a curve quite similar to that of CO2, ceased to rise in about the year 2000 and has not risen since, suggesting that 
the idea of a methane feedback may not be observed in reality. As to your point about 280 to, two, to 380 parts per million, uh, that's an extra 100 parts per million, but it still is only an extra 0.01% of the atmosphere by volume. And given that it is also a logarithmic,